Good morning. If you are joining us in the West Coast of the United States, good afternoon. If you are joining us uh, in the East Coast, and good evening. If you are joining us uh, from further away across the ocean or from the uh, former territories of the Ottoman Empire, my name is Baki Baki Tezjan. I teach history at the University of California in Davis. And I convene the online meetings of the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association for you with the help of the University of California at Davis. Uh, today, you're here to listen to the winner of our uh, graduate student paper prize. Uh, so you know why you're here and the poster is right there. But I'm going to start with a bit, a tiny bit of history uh, it, about the prize, and then in, I will introduce uh, our chair, the, the, the moderator, to you. And then our moderator will take over and introduce uh, the speaker and the discussant, and then our speaker will start. So the Graduate Student Paper Prize, OTSA Graduate Student Paper Prize, has a long history uh, that goes back to all the way to 1989. Um, it, it, at uh, one of these meetings uh, that we have, it was moved, seconded, and passed at $40 be added to the Institute of Turkish Studies grant of $160 to make a $200 prize for the best graduate paper. Uh, unfortunately, uh, since 1989, when the first paper was given, we are still given only $200. Uh, we don't have inflation in OTSA. I am very sorry about that, and I apologize that we are not are able to update our uh, prizes. But the good thing is uh, the prize uh, gives uh, some visibility to our uh, graduate students. And if you look at uh, who's received the prize, I think today is a very, very opportune moment. Uh, the next paper winner in 1990 uh, was uh, Jane Hathaway, our, our moderator today. Uh, she won the paper with the role of the Kuzleras in 17th, 18th century Ottoman Egypt, uh, which probably was the first step uh, in her uh, way to eventually publish the chief eunuch of the Ottoman harem uh, in recent years. Uh, in uh, 1991, the prize was named. Uh, this is also another sort of opportune moment for today, Ohio State University. Our moderator is from Ohio State. Our uh, presenter is from Ohio State. And so for many years, the prize was named after Sidney Nettleton Fisher, who was an Ottoman historian uh, at Ohio State uh, at a time when probably there was not any Ottoman historians um, anywhere in the United States, and at least most colleges in the United States. Uh, he got his degree uh, at Oberlin in economics and MA in history uh, also, and then his PhD was from University of Illinois, um, and then he worked on a dissertation at Illinois on the foreign relations of Turkey during, uh, well, he called it Turkey, the, the Ottoman Empire in uh, during the reign of Bayezid II uh, with uh, Al Leibayer. Um he worked at Robert College, Denison University, and eventually from 1937 to 72, that at 72, I was born in 71. So uh, uh, Professor Fisher taught for a very long time when, as I said, there were not many Ottoman historians around in the United States, Ottoman history at Ohio State. Uh, the prize uh, was renamed Otsa Graduate Student Paper Prize effective this year. So um, while uh, Jane, uh, actually at the time Jane won it, it wasn't called that either. So between Jane and Christopher, uh, it was a Fisher Prize, uh, and now it's back again, also Graduate Student Paper Prize. And if you if you are curious, some of the people who won it over the years, I see another um, another Ohio State connection right here, Watch, uh, who is teaching now at Vermont. And then uh, I see Yeet, who is not teaching at Ohio State. So uh, I, th that's why I wanted to have this presentation, because there are so many connections to Ohio State uh, at, with this award today. Uh, the prize committee for this year, I'm going to try to keep it short before going, uh, without going every, into every detail, but we should uh, name the prize committee that selected the winner. Uh, 
consisted of Vladimir Hamid Troyansky, who is teaching at uh, UC Santa Barbara, uh, Burju Karahan, who teaches at Stanford, and Sarah Fisher, who teaches at Marymount. The board liaison for the committee was Benjamin Fortner from uh, Arizona, and that's also a good uh, actually connection right there. Our discussion today is from University of Arizona. Um, and now to our moderator. Well, our moderator has more books than uh, I guess most people I know in uh, the field of Ottoman history. It is embarrassing for one to see how productive one can be when uh, one is not as productive. It's amazing the number of books uh, uh, our colleague Jane Hathaway published. She is Professor Emeritus of History at Ohio State University and a past president of OTSA back when it was called Turkish Studies Association. She received her PhD from Princeton. Her advisor was Jamal Kafadar, who was already at Harvard by the time she finished her degree. Uh, she has published six books addressing the Ottoman Arab lands, especially Egypt, and the history of the office of Chief Yeneg of the Ottoman Imperial Harem. She has also published many articles on these and other topics. Her current research is on the Ottoman era documents of the Cairo Geniza uh, that I was totally unaware of that even Geniza had Ottoman era documents. I always associated Geniza with Middle Ages. Uh, and I owe special thanks to Jane uh, for uh, this particular volume she edited. It is one of the minor works she did, uh, but for me it was big. It was, uh, I think, one of my first publications, or at least it was the first conference I presented at back in, I think, 1998 or something. Uh, and uh, it became an edited volume, uh, thanks to her. Jane, thank you so much for everything you did for Ottoman and Turkish studies uh, in United States. And please take it away from me. Thank you, Baki. Uh, it's a little bit overwhelming. Um, right, so here is the modus operandi. I will introduce uh, First, our discussant, Linda Darling, then our speaker, Christopher Whitehead. Then Chris will present his paper, followed by Linda's discussion. Um, Chris will have a brief opportunity to respond to any questions or concerns that Linda raises, and then we'll open it up for questions. Since this is a Zoom meeting and not a webinar, you can use the raise hand function. Um, or you can type your question into the chat, in which case I will be reading the question. I will just add, if I accidentally fail to see a raised hand, somebody please type into the chat, so-and-so has a question, because sometimes it does happen. All right, so I'll start with our discussant, Linda Darling, who is professor of history at the University of Arizona and who has been a pillar of the Ottoman field for many years and is like me, uh, past president of this organization. Uh, she received her PhD from the University of Chicago where her advisor was the legendary Halil Inaljik. Um, among her publications are two really seminal books, Revenue Raising and Legitimacy, Tax Collection and Finance Administration in the Ottoman Empire 1560 to 1660, which played a critical role in overturning the so-called decline thesis and a history of social justice and political power in the Middle East, the circle of justice from Mesopotamia to globalization. She has also published many articles on a wide variety of topics and her recent research and publication shed exciting new light on the composition of provincial Janissary Corps and the usefulness of provincial finance reports. And now the man of the hour, Christopher Whitehead is a PhD candidate in history at Ohio State and my advisee. He came to us with a BA from the State University of New York at uh, Albany, and he's completing a dissertation on the role of the Ottoman Imperial Cavalry, the Alta Buluk Halka, in uh, rebellions in the middle part of the 17th century and the implications that these rebellions had for tax collection and financing, as well as Ottoman statecraft in general. He has two articles in print and a third based on today's paper is forthcoming in the special issue of the Review of Middle East Studies. So without further ado, uh, I will turn the floor over to Chris. 
Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you to everyone for coming. I think we can all agree that Köprülü is one of the most well-known names in Ottoman history. As an individual, Köprülü Mehmet Pasha makes it into every survey book. He appears as a personality so strong that he defined the era that he lived in, and he set the stage for everything that came after. He was the Ottoman Empire's Grand Vizier for five years, 1656 to 1661. And during that time, he shifted the course of the empire's history, so much so that modern historians usually label most of the second half of the century as the Köprülü era. His successors ruled the empire for decades, and they became the central political family in the empire after the Ottoman dynasty itself. But the irony of all this success is that when Köprülü became Grand Vizier, his appointment was a surprise to his contemporaries. If it were the capstone on a glorious career, it would have seemed normal. But in fact, compared to most of his peers, he was an obscure figure. One later chronicler describes him at the time as poor, wretched, and nameless, and claims that people would scoff and say, hey, see what the times have come to. Now even someone like Köprülü has taken the office. There's a certain element of myth-making in this, with the author trying to depict Köprülü as coming from humble beginnings. But the basic idea behind it is true. Köprülü was just not a major figure before he became Grand Vizier. If you look through all the chronicle accounts written before that point, you'll find he's barely mentioned at all. It's only in retrospect that he came to be seen as important. This is a problem for historians. It's a problem for historians today, and it was a problem for Ottoman historians too. The first dedicated biographies of Köprülü were written in the early 18th century, about half a century after his death. And not only are they sparse, but they include all kinds of contradictory information. There have been long debates over Korpulu's parentage, his place of birth, and his ethnic background. But the key point for now is that most of what we know about his career comes from these literary sources, these biographies that were trying to grapple with the sudden rise of a man about whom very little was written during his own lifetime. That makes them less than a solid foundation for making sense of his career. So in Köprülü, we have one of the most famous figures in Ottoman history. And yet alongside this fame is this enormous uncertainty about even the basic facts of his life. And that's the problem that I've been trying to grapple with in my paper. So with that problem in mind, the question becomes, how do we get past these literary sources to start studying Köprülü's career and his earlier life? Well, we have the vast wealth of the Ottoman archives, an absolute mountain of documentation about Köprülü and about every other person who ever reached any level of prominence within the Ottoman system. So there's no shortage of material to use. The difficulty is finding out how to use it. Everyone who studies Ottoman officialdom has to deal with the hard reality that the Ottomans didn't use surnames. Most people just had a given name and a title. So in this case, Mehmed Pasha, some individuals had epithets, in this case, Köprülü, which means from Köprü, the name of the town in Northern Anatolia where he settled. But the problem with using his epithet to find him in the archival record is that he only started using it around 1651, and that's pretty late in his life. So it doesn't help us at all for the preceding period. Before that point, we're just left with Mehmed Pasha, the single most common name in existence. What this means is even when we have in our hands a document mentioning him, a lot of the time, it's impossible to know whether or not it's really him or one of the dozens of other Mehmed Pashas floating around at any given time. This challenge of identification gets in the way, not just of studying Köprülü, but of studying Ottoman officialdom in general. I started working on Köprülü while doing dissertation research. My dissertation looks at politics and factionalism in the middle decades of the 17th century. And in the course of that research, I collected a lot of biographical data on contemporary figures and came across references to people in what might otherwise have just been random documents. This gave me enough clues to solve the identification problem, at least to some degree, and to figure out which of the nameless Mehmed Pashas was Köprülü. So I decided to write this paper constructing a new chronology of his career before he became Grand Vizier. Now, partially the result is purely technical it's a good thing to have more accurate information about which governorships he held. 
As historians, we want to know where he was and when. And from that, we can see that the literary sources were wrong about a lot of things. But I don't think most people will be too excited to learn that he governed Adana and not Trabzon, for example. These kind of changes to the traditional story are important, but they don't tell us much about the bigger questions. So what I want to focus on today is less about the technical details, which I'll just go over very briefly, and more about the bigger question of how Koprilu fit into the political constellations of his era. And in that regard, if there's one thing that Koprilu is particularly known for as Grand Vizier, it's for restoring order to the empire. He came to power at a time when the empire was dealing with an extended political and fiscal crisis. And over the course of his period in office, he crushed rebellions and imposed a new form of centralized rule over the empire. Later chronicles and later panegyric writers depict him as a paragon of order who saved the empire from evil rebels. By the end of this presentation, we'll be able to come back to this image with a fresh perspective and question just where it came from and how true it really was. Now, Koprilu was over 80 years old when he died in 1661, so his birth date is estimated to be around 1580, probably in the village of Roshnik in Albania. His biographers tell us that early in life he entered the service of the imperial palace in Istanbul. He worked as a cook there for a very long time, decades. He was probably in his 40s when he left. A common way to explain this was the idea that he could have been recruited through the Devshir Meh, the levy of Christian boys for dynastic service. But this hypothesis has recently been disproven. An entry in the Istanbul court records tells us that Koprilu was actually the grandson of a high-ranking palace cook. So he was already part of an established family, although maybe his grandfather could have been the one who was recruited through the Devshir Meh. For Koprilu, working in the palace kitchens must have been a kind of family tradition, and that's why he stayed there for so long. But sometime in the 1620s, he exited palace service. And like most people who did so, he was rewarded by being enrolled in one of the standing cavalry regiments of the Ottoman household troops. We have a huge amount of documentation on these regiments. They're actually the main focus of my dissertation research. As a cavalryman, Koprilu would have been given an official name and enrolled in a salary register. And one day, Perhaps we'll find a clue that will allow us to figure out what his official name was and to locate him in those registers. I haven't been able to do this myself, but the day that it happens, we'll be able to follow his career during this period in a lot closer detail. For now, though, we're still mostly in the dark when it comes to the 1620s. That being said, this period is very important for another reason. The 1620s is when he moved to Anatolia and settled down in Kupru, the town that later gave him its name. This was a period when the household cavalry regiments were very influential in tax collection, so I strongly suspect that Koprilu might have received an assignment to collect taxes there. But that's just a hypothesis. Right now, there's no way to know for sure. In Koprilu, he became part of the local notability, and he also got married. He married Aisha Hanum, the daughter of a local notable. Their son, the future Grand Vizier Fazl Ahmed Pasha, was also born in Koprilu. All this is to say that Koprilu's decision to settle here was no minor detail. It shaped his life in a lot of important ways, and we're going to be hearing about some more of those ways later on. The second thing we know about Koprilu during the 1620s is that he entered the service of one of his old palace patrons, the Grand Vizier Husserv Pasha. He became his treasurer, and for decades afterward, this was actually the main way that documents identify him. He was known as Mehmed, the former treasurer of Husrev Pasha. So long before he took the name Kuprulu, the former treasurer of Husrev Pasha was the normal way that people referred to him. But Husrev Pasha was executed in 1631, and after that, we're in the dark again. Things only clear up again at the beginning of the 1640s. Kuprulu came back into palace service as an officer, through the patronage of the Grand Vizier at the time, who, like him, was Albanian. After a few years, like many high-ranking palace officers, he then went out to become a provincial governor. This is when he acquired the title Pasha. And this is also where the accounts of his later biographers get the story very wrong. The typical narrative comes from the much later chronicler of the Chronicle of Silatar. 
He says that Kopralu first became a governor when the Grand Vizier who supported him was executed. He was sent off in exile to govern, tra govern Trabzon. But in fact, this never happened. We have a very useful series of documents listing the governors of most of the empire's provinces during these years. So it's not actually very hard to follow uh, people around and to see who was governing where. The problem is identification, like I mentioned before. There are a lot of Mehmed Pashas, so who is the right one? Fortunately, there's a clue in another document that lets us make the connection. A decade later, bureaucrats were trying to figure out the accounting situation of the province of Adana. Somebody who governed there owed the treasury a lot of money, and they needed to know who. So they reviewed the registers, and one of the scribes left this helpful little note explaining that the governor in 1643 was Kopralu Mehmed Pasha. Because the note was written much later, he appears with his full epithet and title. So we can say that the Mehmed Pasha who governed Adana in 1643 was Kopralu. And from there, it's a simple matter of going back to the list of governors and following that person everywhere he goes. And it turns out that his path fits exactly with what we know about Kopralu's career from other documents. This solves the mystery, at least, at least for this period, and gives us a solid chronology. And it shows us that the story about him being exiled to Trabzon was false. Now, none of the offices that Kopralu held were very prestigious, and he didn't hold them for very long either. We see him jumping around from place to place, not able to stay in any one position for more than a few months. Things got slightly better toward the end of the 1640s. He governed Damascus and Anatolia, both of which were prestigious. But the big turning point in his life was the year 1651. This was a period of very intense factionalism and competition for office in the imperial center. Kopralu had a friend inside the palace, someone close to the queen mother, the Albanian eunuch Kasma, who helped him to get a seat on the imperial council. This is when he got his epithet. When he went to sit on the imperial council, he needed some way to identify himself. And so the identity that got attached to his name was Kopralu, the man from the town of Kopru. At this point, and this is what the later chroniclers tell us, contemporary chroniclers don't say anything, he made a bid to become Grand Vizier. The actual Grand Vizier, Guru Mehmed Pasha, reacted by having him exiled, a favorite political tactic of his. He accused Kopralu of sedition, fitne, and sent him off to a small district in Bulgaria. This is actually what prompted that audit of the accounts of the governorship of Adana that I mentioned earlier. The bureaucrats discovered that huge sums of money owed by the Grand Vizier's brother were actually owed by Kopralu, which is very convenient for them. So the Grand Vizier was using the machinery of state to really punish Kopralu as much as he possibly could. This exile was extremely hard for him. It cut him off from patronage in the capital and set back his already not particularly impressive career. The biographical narratives depict this exile as a transformation. Afterward, he supposedly went back home to Kopru and lived there quietly without participating in politics for the next few years. But the documentary record shows something very different. They show that he became a governor again in the province of Karamatolia. Here, the difference between what the biographical narratives say and what the documentary evidence says is not just purely technical, but it's actually extremely important. And it has the potential to really change how we understand Kopralu as a historical figure. Because at the same time that Kopralu was the governor of Karaman, the province was going through a serious crisis. Two Ottoman officials were battling it out over who would get to administer a large group of Turkmen pastoral nomads. At the height of the conflict, each side mobilized over a thousand mercenaries. So this was something on the scale of a local civil war, and much of the province was engulfed in the violence. The reason the conflict was so intense was because it was backed by a political fight led by a figure named Ibshir Pasha, who at that time was the governor of Aleppo. A few years earlier, Ibshir had launched a rebellion and seized control over a number of offices in Anatolia and Syria. That was in 1651, the same year that Kopralu was exiled. For that rebellion, some contemporaries called Ibshir a Jalali rebel, he maintained a large army and a large factional following to make it impossible for the central government to challenge him. Of course, Ipshir didn't see himself as a rebel. He thought of himself as a reformer 
and claimed to be opposing a corrupt central government in Istanbul. He hoped to become Grand Vizier and to renew the empire by getting rid of the evil practices that he thought were corrupting it, especially bribery. So we have this conflict in Karaman province in which one side is backed by a group accused of being Jalali rebels and Koprulu was the governor. He had to decide how to deal with this situation. And here I've come across an important piece of evidence. This is a complaint brought against Koprulu by a group of Turkmen. They report to the capital that Koprulu attacked them, that he sent an army of 300 mercenaries against them and robbed their caravan. What this shows is that Koprulu was involved somehow in the conflict. He had an army of mercenaries and he used them to attack a group of Turkmen. This is strange if we're thinking about Koprulu in terms of the image that later chroniclers built up for him. So what was going on? How can we explain this? Well, years later, the rebel Ipshir Pasha did become Grand Vizier. And one of the first things he did was appoint all of his friends and allies to provincial governorships. And one of those people he appointed was Koprulu. Ipshir made him governor of Trabulus in Syria. So Ipshir trusted Koprulu enough to make him one of his governors. Since we know that Koprulu was involved somehow in the conflict in Karaman, the explanation seems straightforward. If Koprulu supported Ipshir Pasha's faction, then that would explain how he won his favor and became his choice to govern Trabulus. But the connection doesn't end there. Ipshir didn't last very long as Grand Vizier. He was killed when soldiers rose up and had him executed. Then the remnants of his faction formed an army in Anatolia to get revenge. They started another rebellion. And several Ottoman chroniclers tell us that Koprulu was part of that army. So now we have three points of connection. Koprulu took part in the conflict in Karaman. Ipshir appointed him as a provincial governor. And when Ipshir died, Koprulu joined the rebel army formed by his supporters. Okay, Koprulu, part of a rebel faction. This is diametrically opposed to our modern understanding of him. He's usually shown to be an opponent of all kinds of rebels, someone who stood for order and central authority. We don't expect him to be using mercenaries to assault caravans or forming alliances with so-called Jalali governors. So the next thing we have to ask is how and why he became involved with this faction. I should point out that there are a lot of things that should have stood in the way of this. In theory, Ipshir and Koprulu belonged to competing groups in the Ottoman elite. Following the work of Metin Kunt, it's commonly recognized that ethnic regional solidarity was an important element in Ottoman elite's factionalism. People from the Balkans, so-called Westerners, tended to stick together and to oppose people from the Caucasus, so-called Easterners. As an Albanian, Koprulu was a Westerner. Ipshir was Abkhazian, an Easterner. And many of the other leading figures in Ipshir's faction were also Easterners. So they sat at opposite ends of this divide. And from this perspective, they should have been rivals, not allies. Well, I mentioned toward the beginning of the presentation that Koprulu's decision to settle in the town of Kopru was important, and this is why. Ipshir's household was based in Tokat, an important commercial center just a few days' journey away from Kopru. In other words, both of these figures were part of the regional elite of a very small area, north-central Anatolia. Koprulu and Ipshir may have had very different regional origins, but what they had in common were their regional ties in the here and now. And this was an important element too. Living and operating in close proximity could be the basis for forming a cooperative relationship. But in this respect, Ipshir wasn't actually the most important person here. The more important figure was Ipshir's right-hand man, Abaza Hassan. Those of you familiar with Abaza Hassan will probably know him for his great Anatolian rebellion in 1658, while Koprulu was Grand Vizier. Abaza Hassan tried and failed to overthrow Koprulu, and that's how he's gone down in history, as Koprulu's great enemy. In fact, he's the main figure against whom all of these pro-Koprulu panegyrics were being written. They depict Abaza Hassan as the ultimate evil rebel 
and they praise Kupralu for eliminating him and restoring order to the empire. Well, Abaza Hassan got his start as part of Ipshir Pasha's faction. He was Ipshir's most trusted confidant, a close ally and advisor. And if you want to add a dot to this map for Abaza Hassan, where can we put it? Chronicles don't tell us where he was from, but archival sources do. An early reference to Abaza Hassan from the 1630s calls him Amasyala Abaza Hassan, meaning that he was from the district of Amasya, the same district that the town of Kopru was located in. But to get even more specific, we can look through a detailed survey of the district created in 1643. And what do we find? We find that the dot for Abaza Hassan is already on the map. He was a resident of Kopru. Kopru Lumehme Pasha and Abaza Hassan settled down in exactly the same provincial town. And when I saw this, I couldn't believe my eyes. I mean, how could this be? We're talking about the two great enemies of the 1658 rebellion. And by pure coincidence, they both happen to be from the same little town. Except it's not a coincidence. And everything now makes so much more sense. Kopralu joined this Jalali faction because it was led by people he was already familiar with. Ipshir Pasha and Nabaza Hassan weren't distant figures. They were literally his neighbors. This is why he aligned with them. It's why he joined their army. And it's also why, when he became Grand Vizier, he patronized and supported Abaza Hassan. Historians have long puzzled over why Abaza Hassan, who all the court-affiliated chronicles call an evil rebel, benefited at first from Kopralu's patronage. Some have suggested that Kopralu was trying to placate him or to buy him off. Kopralu promoted him to be the governor of Aleppo. He gave him extraordinary powers, and he gave him the honorary rank of vizier. Was this all just dissimulation? But now it's easier to see what was really going on. Baza Hassan and Kopralu were allies. They were two provincial elites from the same town who, at first, supported one another. But then something went horribly wrong. Abaza Hassan launched a rebellion against Kopralu. He tried to topple him from power. Why? The pro Kopralu writers say it was because Abaza Hassan was evil. He was a rebel who knew that Kopralu was going to come to punish him. But Kopralu's panegyrics aren't the only chronicles that survive. We have a pro Abaza Hassan chronicle, too, by an author named Nihadi. And this chronicle makes it clear that the real issue was Kopralu's behavior as Grand Vizier. To put it bluntly, Kopralu killed a lot of people. He was a reformer, but he was a reformer that many contemporaries described as bloodthirsty. He executed statesmen, massacred soldiers, and not one, but two Sheikh Islams, who he appointed to legitimize his actions, turned against him and declared that what he was doing was unjust. All this is to say that as Grand Vizier, Kopralu had a serious legitimacy problem. Pro Kopralu writers claim that all this killing was necessary to restore order to the empire. But Nihadi was definitely not alone in his belief that Kopralu's real aim was to make himself an absolute ruler. In this chronicler's eyes, Abaza Hassan revolted to put a stop to the killing, to put a stop to Kopralu's bid to take control over the whole empire. And Kopralu's legitimacy problem is what produced this literary landscape that we're presented with today. Authors trying to legitimize his methods of rule constru constructed this sharp dichotomy between Kopralu, the heroic reformer, and Abaza Hassan, the evil rebel. Two opposites, diametrically opposed to each other. This myth-making has left a legacy that extends into modern times. In the old grand narrative of Ottoman decline, Kopralu was supposed to be the man who stopped that decline, temporarily, and restored the power of the state. This narrative put the state at the center of the story, and so centralizing measures had to be inherently a good thing. It didn't matter how Kopralu achieved what he did. The people who lost their lives in his purges and his executions just got what they deserved. They were either the causes or the symptoms of the decline that he was supposed to be trying to stop. This framing goes all the way back to Kopralu himself. It's at the heart of the panegyrics that justify what he was doing by telling the readers that the victims were all rebels, Jalalis, 
evil men who had to be killed for the sake of the world order. But the reality is that Koprilu was not as disconnected from these rebels as he's been made to appear. Before he became Grand Vizier, he nurtured ties to the so-called Jalali faction of Ipshir Pasha. He supported them during his governorship in Karaman. Then he joined the rebel army that set out to get revenge for Ipshir's death. Later on, Koprilu might have had himself depicted as the unwavering opponent of all rebels. But what we learn from re-examining his early career is that at one point he could have been counted among them. So what do we do with this information? In conclusion, I just want to raise two points. The first is that I think the dichotomy between Koprilu and the Jalali rebels was a myth. It was an image that was constructed in a particular historical context for a particular reason, as a way of addressing Koprilu's legitimacy problem. Demythologizing Koprilu means taking his contemporary critics seriously. The criticism has to be more than just a footnote. It's an integral part of the story. And paying more attention to it can help us make sense of what the Koprilu era meant for the people who lived through it. The second point is I think Koprilu's career tells us something important about the Ottoman governing elite. It tells us that Ottoman elites were not all oriented entirely toward Istanbul. Localism played an important role in how they formed connections and how they pursued their careers. Koprilu and Abaza Hassan came from opposite ethnic regional origins, but they came together in Kupru, the town where both of them settled. So it's important to pay attention not only to where Ottoman grandees came from, but also where they went, where they set down roots. In other words, not just the regional ties they were born with, but also, but also those they created for themselves. The importance of these local ties are visible right there in Kupru's name. At one point, he was just Mehmet Pasha, when it came time for him to take on an epithet, his most distinguishing feature was his local identity. The name that went down in history was Kuprulu, the man from Kupru. His settlement there was no incidental detail. It was decisive in shaping his career. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chris, for that very fascinating paper. And now we'll turn to Professor Linda Darling's commentary. Uh, Linda, the floor is yours. And you need to unmute. Yes, I figured that out. Uh, thank you very much, Jane. And thank you, Chris, for your uh, fascinating presentation. It's completely understandable why Chris Whitehead won the Oza Paper Prize. This paper is a methodical tour de force, combining textual and documentary sources to provide information, leading to a new reconstruction and interpretation of the career of Kabrilu Mehmet Pasha. It shows an immense amount of work, uncovering previously unused archival sources and obscure notices in the Chronicles, compiling earlier works on the subject and not ignoring any possible source of information. Students today are fortunate to have at their disposal an increasing number of published and edited and transliterated Ottoman historical, historical works that languished in manuscript when I was a student or were available only in faulty 19th century publications. You could hardly call them editions. The archives also, they, though they were open, were only accessible by jumping over numerous hoops. We had access to the original documents, which was nice, but only five deftairs at a time. And photocopies were limited to 100 per topic. If you could get photocopy permission at all, which was separate from getting research permission. Chris Whitehead has taken advantage of the greater access of today to conduct a wide ranging search for the tiniest bits of information. He scoured not only recognized sources on state careers, such as the Ruz Defter Liri, Timar Defter Liri, and court records, but more obscure documents, such as letters, accounting registers, and complaint registers. He doesn't appear to have used the Muhimna registers, and it would be good to know if he searched them and found them unhelpful or if they have yet to be added to his source base. 
he made good use of the headings of documents on other topics, such as tax registers, that list who was in command of the province when the document was produced. With respect to chronicles, he sought, sought out not only the published examples, but those edited in unpublished Turkish theses and dissertations. And he checked the edited versions against the manuscripts. He spent a lot of time disentangling the early Kerpulu, who had not yet received that name and was known as Mehmet Pasha, from the jillion other Mehmet Pashas that the empire produced. All this hard labor has enabled him to develop a new understanding of Kerpulu's early career. Whitehead emphasizes Kerpulu's obscurity before becoming Grand Vizier in order to explain why his early life became a historiographical problem. He locates the nexus of that problem in the years 1652 to 55, immediately before Kerpulu's appointment to the Grand Vizierate. His role in the Jalali crisis of the 1650s in Karaman, where he was the provincial governor, and his relationship with Ipshir Mustafa Pasha. Prior to that, he covers Kerpulu's career as a Sanjak Bay and Baylor Bay, correcting some dates and identifications and explaining some of the relationships that Kerpulu built up during the course of his career. Kerpulu emerges from obscurity only in 1651 when he attained vizierial rank and was given a seat on a divan. From this point on, he was involved in the rivalry for the Grand Vizierate, both for his patrons and for himself. Though for, for several years, he was not very successful. Thus, his eventual appointment was not a total surprise. Although he was considered an unlikely candidate since he'd been accused of corruption and facade. Nevertheless, he was appointed to governorships in Karaman and became embroiled with Ipshir Pasha and Abba Zahasan. Whitehead's most important substantive contribution in this article is his tracing of the relationship between Kerpalu and Abba Zahasan to their shared residence in the town of Kerpalu which of course helps explain Kerpalu's early adherence to the faction of Abba Zahasan and Ipshir Pasha. Ipshir Pasha's reforming agenda may have also played a role. Thus, Kerpalu's appointment as Grand Vizier becomes more explicable. His conflicted relationship with Abba Zahasan also lay at the root of Abba Zah's rebellion when Abba Zah gets painted as a rebellious bandit oppressor and Kerpalu as a just administrator, a bridge over troubled waters. The changing Kerpulu Abaza relationship becomes a key to the alterations in the political landscape of the mid 17th century and the surprising career of a relatively obscure official. By clarifying Kerpulu's early career, adding missing information, and settling some of the historiographical disputes around it, Whitehead makes his subsequent political actions more comprehensible. He enables us to understand better the factional rival rivalries of the period that were so important for the course of Ottoman politics. And he highlights the role of archival documents in expanding and amending the chronicle narrative. Further questions, some of which uh, he raised in his presentation, if not in his article, include the following. How did Kerpelu's early career shape his subsequent policies and actions. It certainly made him knowledgeable about his allies and opponents and how to deal with the factional politics at the top level of Ottoman government, which he's so famous for controlling. Did the agendas of Abba Zahasan and Ipshir Pasha influence his ideas about military and fiscal reform during his Grand Vizierate? Or were those relationships based merely on propinquity and not on like-mindedness? What made Abba Zahasan a rebel and Kerpulu a loyal official? Another issue, what do his and his allies' careers tell us about central provincial relations, which as Whitehead shows, played such a large role in their stories? Modern studies of politics at the center tend to ignore the provinces, but clearly they were more than just miles of territory to cross or minor cities to be exiled to. So finally, can provincial studies provide a better sense of what was going on away from the capital? What happened to Kerpuru when Abaza and Kerpuru left it? Did the intellectual life they clearly shared in continue? 
Do the provinces reflect or react against the capital? Whitehead's methodological study, therefore, has raised for us a number of substantive questions and new research directions that would help make the 17th century more, much more comprehensible as a period. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, Chris, you have a chance to respond to Linda's comments, especially that accusation about not using the image. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> it's not an accusation, it's a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for these generous comments. Uh, I'm really honored to have you participating in this. Uh, the point that you made about the greater access to archival materials compared to the research conditions of previous decades is really important because I carried out this research a little bit before COVID, but mostly after COVID broke out. And one of the impacts of COVID is that the Ottoman archives went online. And suddenly, you don't even have to be in Istanbul to access all these documents. Uh, it's just possible to have a, an account and to see digitized documents anytime. If I'm reading a book and I come across a reference, I can pull up the archival document in front of me instantaneously. Or if I suddenly realize that my research agenda was looking in the wrong direction and actually I need another kind of document that I didn't think about when I was in Istanbul, it's possible to follow up those leads. And so... I mean, the the changing systems we have for carrying out research are are incredible. They they certainly made possible what I was doing. I wouldn't be able to have written this article if it hadn't been for the online accessibility of all these documents. And I'm really interested to see what's going to happen to the field of Ottoman history over the next few years because people the way people do research is going to be changing. As for Muhimmiz. Uh, the answer is that I just didn't find very much in the Muhimmiz addressing the particular issues that I wrote about in the paper. Properly didn't tend to show up. Uh, the Muhimmiz record is spotty. Uh, we don't really have a complete it's series for the entire period. time. Yes, exactly. So I did look, I looked into the Muhimmiz, but I didn't really find them as useful as other kinds of documents. And also the Muhimmiz are just generally better studied. People, everybody knows about them. Uh, it's, I think, one of the, well, at least when I was preparing for my research and I was compiling lists of everything that I was expecting to to do when I was in Istanbul, the Muhimmiz were at the top of the list because it's so often recommended. Uh, but in this case, I didn't find that they had what I was looking for. Uh, the the question that you asked about whether Kupralu's early experiences might have shaped his later policies is a really fascinating one, even if I don't know if I have the answer, because I've been kind of speculating about this myself. After Abaza Hassan's rebellion, you have the initiation of a vast process by which Anatolia is scoured by imperial agents, and everyone who's considered to be loyal to Abaza Hassan or to have taken part in Abaza Hassan's rebellion is accused of these crimes, and their properties are confiscated. As individuals, they might either be executed or sent into exile. And it's a more comprehensive form of, uh, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Uh, you know, a survey of, of Anatolia to remove unwanted elements from the perspective of the central government than had ever occurred before. And I have to wonder if the fact that Kopralu was not only from Anatolia in the sense of having settled there, but also deeply interconnected with the very faction that was being hunted down in these searches, if that wasn't part of the reason why it was so successful and possible. And it certainly impacted the town of Kupru. Uh, Baza Hassan's personal property and the personal property of his followers was confiscated during this process. And some of it ended up in the Kupru family's hands. It was sold to Fazl Ahmed Pasha, sold to other members of his family. And so it absolutely has an impact on the town. I gotta wonder how much, how much of an element of the town not being big enough for the both of them. It was. It's also um, true in Syria. Uh, many, many people were dismissed. I don't know what happened to them with their properties. Mm -hmm. uh, but Absolutely. It, it extends down into Syria as well. Uh, and the, re the reformist agenda of Ibshir is another thing. Um, during the presentation, I made the point that we should take criticism of Kupralu more seriously. I think we should also look at 
criticism of the so-called Jalalis uh, more critically. We should recognize that a lot of this criticism is coming from a particular perspective and is being constructed by state-centric authorities. And these people who are referred to as rebels don't think about themselves in those terms necessarily. And so Ibshir may have been called the Jalali, but at the same time, he saw himself as a reformer and thought that the real problem was with the central government. So it's absolutely the case that in aligning with them, Koprilu himself may have thought of himself as following the same kind of reformist agenda that he later put into practice. I think we're probably ready to open the floor to questions and we already have uh, our first one. Um, for everyone else, our first and second ones, um, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see reactions. And if you click on reactions at the bottom, you'll see raise hand, or you can just type, I have a question in the chat. Our first question uh, comes from Professor Elena frangakis Syrid, who is, oh, she's changed her name. She was uh, masquerading as me for a while. So Elena, please. Uh, you need to unmute. First of all, my apologies. I've never done that uh, mistake before. And thank you for allowing me both uh, Becky and, and uh, Jane to, to um, remain because I was exceedingly interested in Christopher's uh, um, uh, presentation and um, uh, which was incredibly well um, uh, summarized and, and, the, and the good points even all the, all the good points even, even better um, uh, promoted by, by Linda. And uh, I'm very glad I did. I want to congratulate you, Christopher, because you changed entirely my idea of, of uh, Kupralu era, especially since I'm a 18th century historian. And of course, you know, I follow the 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 um, traditional uh, um, knowledge, you know, knowledge of 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 this uh, on this era. Um, I just wanted to ask you two questions, nevertheless. Also, you know, congratulating you very much for that uh, presentation. How do you, and they're not, they're not like um, contesting or it just said, want to know more, uh, contesting, no. Um, so how, what else, what, what, how would you describe his ability to improve the budget deficit and the budget situation of the, uh, of uh, the, uh, of, of, of his era, which he improved as far as uh, the traditional view goes, unless you don't think so. And secondly, how much do you think the um, the economic crisis of the 17th century, which was incredibly um, dismantling uh, Europe as well as the Mediterranean in wars and in malarias and in uh, um, epidemics and also in um, in uh, incredibly economic recessions, were also a part of his era and of and of uh, the problems that the empire had during during. Uh, his time and already from 1620s on. Thank you. Mm. Uh, absolutely. The Koprilu did uh, resolve the budget deficit. And this is a problem that had been plaguing the empire for quite a long time. And the, the broader context of uh, economic crises in the 17th century affecting Europe and the Middle East and areas beyond absolutely sets the stage for those, those crises. Um, Koprilu's resolution of the budgetary crisis is actually something that I've looked into myself and written about in my thesis. And what I've found is the two most impactful measures that he took to do so was one, reducing expenses by cutting the size of the cavalry branch of the Ottoman standing army. And this group was closely associated with Abaza Hassan. Abaza Hassan himself came from this group. Uh, although I should mention that Koprilu himself did also come from this group at one point uh, when he graduated from the palace much earlier. But reducing the number of cavalry soldiers was one side of, of the coin. The other side was increasing revenue. And the way he increased revenue was by simply increasing taxes on the general population of the empire. I found that there is a very significant tax increase that incurs that Koprilu initiates at the same time as Abaza Hassan's rebellion and partially using the rebellion as a legitimizing tool, saying that because of the rebellion, taxes have to be increased in the Balkans to support forces fighting in Anatolia, except after the rebellion is crushed, the taxes don't go back down. So there's the, an, the beginning of a long-term higher rate of taxation, direct taxation that is 
on the central provinces of the empire. And that is probably the or one of the most impactful measures he took to resolve the budgetary crisis. I can't imagine that it made him very popular, though. Thank you. And next up is Baki. Uh, Chris, uh, first of all, congratulations. This is an amazing paper. I, you know, I've been, I think this is the 27th WhatsApp we are having. And I, because of my area of interest, uh, I, I must say this was the uh, paper that I learned most from. So I really, 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 really appreciate all the work you did uh, to uh, give us a fuller portrait of this uh, man. In, in one way, um, it, it, of course, it's very surprising in terms of uh, how we perceive him, what your findings, but it, when you think about it, perhaps it is not that surprising in the sense that in order to, uh, very often uh, the, the, the people who rise to the top and then get to people, get to others, actually had that experience because that's how they know how they do these things so that he can, once he comes to the top, he can crush them and cut their resources because he was one of them. So in that sense, it makes perfect sense. But of course, it's very surprising. And I'm so, so, so impressed by everything you found. I have a, many questions, but I'm only going to ask one. The, the connection to Kökrü and Abaza Hassan is there any possibility that uh, the woman he married in Kökrü, you did mention the family, but I cannot remember what exactly, how exactly you uh, described the marriage. You said she was the daughter of a local, maybe, but is it possible that per, that person might be also of Abaza origin? The, the reason I'm asking this is, uh, I remember, I think a paper by Ebul Hajj, uh, mentioning how the uh, Dave Shirme types marry into uh, also women who are from the palace or they themselves have different origins. Is it possible that the family he married into was of Caucasus and then settled in Kupru as well? Do you know anything about the family a little bit more? Thank you, thank you so much. Well, thank you for those generous compliments. And we, uh, it's it's not me. It's prior historians who have who have discovered some of the basic information about that family. Uh, but we know that the name of her father, the his wife's name is Aisha Hanum, and her father's name is Yusufa. And we know his title that he was the so-called Zaim or Subasha of Kopru. But we don't know his background, and the broader family relations beyond that are kind of mysterious. The other side of the coin is what were Abaza Hassan's family relations. He has a number of people who are described as his sons-in-law, and Evliya Chelebi mentions their names in connection with the town of Kopru. But uh, it's or uh, more evidence is going to be required before we can fully reconstruct the exact family relations there, but it's definitely a future avenue where we might find uh, different kinds of connections and different connections to other parts of the empire. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I also very much appreciate this as an example of how the Balkans was connected with Anatolia. One really feels that this was an empire where people could move and make new homes for themselves. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. And next up is Amy Singer. And please unmute. Yep, I got it. Um, so. Chris, I have to say this is the second really impressive paper I've heard you give in six months. The last one was at Mesa in Denver. Um, so I'm now a groupie, I will confess. And I am jealous of your students who must have a wonderful time uh, studying with you. And thank you also for the narration, because I think you've you've nailed a certain narrative style. I can see it developing into a more fiction-oriented uh, direction, um, which Baki's question suggested, that is, we would discover, in fact, that um, Kupralu ends up marrying someone who had originally been, you know, promised to Abaza Hassan. <laughs> and, you know, you can see the, the screenwriters just having a field day with that. Um, but more seriously, um, so 
two things, one a, a comment and then a question that continues on from um, what Elena had asked and, and what you talked about more extensively. So the first is that as you were speaking, what really was um, kind of echoing in my mind was the biographical narrative that Robert Dankoff created in his translation of Evlia that's called, um, what is it called? The Life of an Ottoman Statesman. And one of the things that comes out in reading that, and my students actually enjoy it very much, is the personal rivalries um, and the sense in which people were gunning for individuals, you know, when they had the chance from their positions of power. And, and Evelia's observation, you know, of what happens, you know, when Kerperlu takes control as Grand Vizier, you know, what happens to his own patron and how all these things play out, um, suggests that there was um, that there was a real element of personal in the political uh, and that these rivalries were deep seated uh, and that just vindictiveness <laughs> was, you know, an emotion that was legitimate to invoke when deciding who to go after. So that, that's one thing. But the thing that I think is really important is the extent to which you suggested that we need to just dismantle this whole characterization of the 17th century as a whole Jalali era, that that was much too facile a way of, of putting everything together. And that although you know, we could use Jalali to describe late 16th and early 17th century you know, incidents and, and you know, a, a sort of series of events and, and the label then very conveniently gets kind of extended way into the 17th century as a way of describing what's going on. And I think the label masks very, you know, very much evolving, changing uh, political dynamics, which have, I think, kept us from looking at or for the kinds of things that you've pointed out to us that we really need to look at these different kinds of rivalries as reflecting um, how politics worked. And, you know, to pick up some of the things that Baki's written about, the importance of the politics of Pashas in this era for really, you know, moving the empire in different directions. So, um, and so any further reflections you have on, you know, should we jettison Jalali altogether? Should we really? limit it to a very particular period. Um, I think that given given the people you've worked with and given um, Linda Darling's voice here, you know, taking aim at another big uh, kind of iconic label of Ottoman history is certainly is very much suggested by what you're doing. Thank you. Yes, I, I mean, as, as I was carrying out this and other research, I've been paying attention to the way that the term Jalali gets used. And for one, it's definitely a, a polemic term. I mean, nobody wants to be labeled a Jalali. It's, it's something that uh, one group will, or one individual will use it with reference to another in order to fit them into a excluded category to say that this person's not a legitimate part of the Ottoman state and society. They're, they're something else. And the interesting thing about Abaza Hassan's rebellion and about the way it's characterized by pro corporal sources, including official state declarations, is that Abaza Hassan is explicitly called a Jalali, whereas earlier rebels are not necessarily. So the government never calls Ipshir a Jalali. Evliya Chalabi does, because he's kind of operating on a register that is more casual, and it kind of shows a little bit of how people in everyday use might have referred to these people or thought about them. And some chronicles say that popularly Ibshir and certain other rebels of the time were called Jalalis, but the government, uh, even during the rebellions, never calls them Jalalis. It calls them Eshkia or other generic terms for rebels, because Jalali seems to have a, a heavier and more intense meaning. And I think you're right. You, the way that the term gets used sometimes masks 
the interconnected nature of all of these individuals. People really got around and everyone knew everyone. If there's anything that seems to emerge from all this, it's, it's that. Yes, um, thank you. Are there other questions? Can I ask a question or do we need to wrap up, Bucky? Uh, you can definitely ask a question. I see Elena's hand up too. And I also have a, another question too. I just didn't want to ask two questions at once. So please go ahead, please. Actually, I'll, I'll uh, cede the floor to Elena because I have the advisor's privilege of being able to uh, torment Chris with questions all the time. So I'll give him a break. <laughs> I thank you very much, Jane, and congratulate you too also for, for your student. Oh my God, yes. And 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 uh, Amy, yes, I'm now a groupie also of Christopher. Absolutely, and of Jane with us such students. All right, the, two questions for me. One is, it, got, it is a direct one from when you said about the um, raising taxation in the Balkans. Did they do it directly? Did they, or did they do it through tax farmers? And how did they get away with saying, well, there are, there are, I mean, did, did the peasants like it in, in, in the Balkans, um, paying for um, ongoing um, a, a, a turbulence in Anadolia? How would they care? Why would they care? In fact, right? That's not one, especially as, as there were problems generally that economic that would have engulfed them too um, in the Balkans. And secondly, about the decline, this is an excellent point you're making, absolutely excellent, in that there wasn't a decline that he stopped. There was presumably also going on from Amy's and, and from Paki's um, uh, questions, was there, instead of a decline, should we see it as an ongoing um, interweaving of networks, given the size of the empire, to, um, to, to, to negotiate the ruling and none of these uh, Jalali even rebellions could bring the empire down. It wasn't something, it was simply um, governing an empire or the internal governing of an empire, given the size of it. Thank you. Mm. I hope I'm being clear enough. Yes, it is clear. Thank you. So the tax we're talking about is called the Bede de Nuzul. It's part of the Avaraz tax system, which the whole population of these central regions of the empire categorized into household tax units and then assessed on the basis of a certain amount of, of cash tax that they have to pay every year. And what happened is uh, Abaza Hassan launched his rebellion and then Kupralu issued a decree saying next year, the Sultan is going to personally lead a campaign into Anatolia to fight Abaza Hassan. So we're doubling, well, actually they doubled it in Anatolia. In the Balkans, it went from 400 to 600. So 50% increase. We're increasing this tax to fund this military campaign. Before the military campaign could be launched, Abaza Hassan was defeated. And so they announced, as a kindness to the empire's population, we're going to reduce the tax by 100 for one year. So they raised the tax by 200. And then this is to fund a campaign that never occurs. And to celebrate the non occurrence of that campaign, they lower it only by 100. So they didn't even get rid of the amount of the increase that they implemented in the first place. It's kind of ironic. But it's this direct tax, the Bedel and Nuzul, as part of the Avaraz system, that is the mechanism leading to greater taxation. And there's a lot of, of complaints about this, as you can imagine. You can find petitions from people in various regions saying that they're incapable of paying it, asking for exemption, trying to get out of it in some way or another. Uh, yes, next we have Baki again, and then thank Linda. You. Uh, thank you, thank you. What, uh, this question is about your dissertation topic, because I don't know whether I can get a hold of you again. I, I Something we started talking about right before this started, while we everybody else was in the waiting room. I'm really curious, uh, did you look into the sources of how the number of uh, Alta Buluk Halka got so large? And then are there more examples of people buying their way into it uh, through tax farms? So uh, the conditional tax farms that uh, sort of guarantee entry into six Altabuluk Halka 
if the tax farm is finished. Uh, there are examples of this that Linda had found, that I had found, but I'm curious whether they're in such numbers that uh, help us understand how their numbers got so uh, great in late 16th, early 17th centuries, even though you know these numbers were not coming from uh, regular graduates of other things uh, and cavalry units are not supposed to be really very large at a time when you are moving into infantry. Um, is, has there been anything in your dissertation on that? Yes. So first, the specific phenomenon of, of tax farms with a condition of enrollment. I don't really see that in the 17th century. I, I get the sense that that's more of a late 16th century phenomenon. Uh, of course, there are lots of people who are who are tax farmers who are cavalrymen, but the mechanism is the other way around. Uh, there's an institution which I talk about in one of the chapters of my dissertation called Mulazimet, in which cavalrymen are being assigned every year by the central government to go out and become tax farmers. And this is theoretically a reward for military service. In practice, of course, you can imagine that it would be abused and lots of the people who are taking advantage of it were not actually military veterans, but at least in theory, that's how it's supposed to work. As for the increase, so far as I can tell, the, the biggest cause of the increase is the, the warfare that the empire is going through in the late 16th century. Because there's a phenomenon that recurs starting in the 1580s in which the Ottomans conquer a new fortress and they need to establish a fortress garrison. And they create a condition that says 1,000, 2,000 people are going to be the garrison of this fortress. And if they serve a three-year term, at the end of that term, they become cavalrymen in the Alta Bukalka. And so do that a few times and you've got thousands of new enrollees. And we see this occurring in the Caucasus, it occurs in Hungary. And so I think this is the main reason why it's increasing. There, Thank you. Thank you so I should much. briefly mention that there are also financial interests. People bribe their way in. Lots of evidence for that too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, Linda? Yeah, I want to go back to the taxes and ask if uh, your figures are corrected for inflation. Uh, or what inflation is doing in the middle of the 17th century. In the long run, they're, they're not, because uh, I couldn't tell you off, off the top of my head uh, what the inflation corrected rate would have been from early in the century to late in the century. But what I see is simply that the number in Anatolia, the, the standard rate for the bed of the Nizul in Anatolia is 300. This Before is in Akches, right? What's that? In Akches, right? Yeah, yeah, in Akches. The, the standard rate for the bed of the Nizul in Anatolia is 300. And in, in the Balkans, it's 400. And then Koprilu comes to power, Abaza Hassan revolts, and immediately the rates are changed to 600 in, in each. So 600 becomes the standard rate thereafter. Yeah, okay. Are there other questions or comments? Uh, Baki, I defer to you. Should we wrap things up? Uh, I, I saw Victor's hand up. Victor, oh, really? hi. hi. Yeah, I, have a, I have a question here. Camera here. Um, so, about cavalry uh, and warfare, um, so the um, you know just as the Tamar has been sort of you know been swept away because it was at the age that Tamar is gone. Um, say in the seventeenth century, cavalry was still kind of important. I think we should not underestimate it. Robert Frost in this wonderful book on Polish Lithuanian and Commonwealth pointed out that um, as part of the the modern wars in perspective series pointed out that, for example, in the wars of the Commonwealth with Muscovy, cavalry was extremely important in siege warfare of, of all things. Well, basically, it's to to control supply lines and cut off cut off re resupply. Um, so that's that's that's. I'm I don't know. I'm wondering if Chris has an idea. I mean, these Alta Baluk, what kind of cavalry they would be? You know, I mean, there's, there's so many of them, but they, the quality is cavalry. That's an interesting question. And thank you for your presentation. I'm really, really nice to follow your work. Thank you. Yeah, I just, just to mention that I, I agree with that principle in general. I think the idea that 
you know, you have a shift from the 16th to the 17th century in which cavalry somehow becomes obsolete. I think that's kind of an exaggeration. Of course, cavalry is always going to be necessary for armies. And uh, it may not be a coincidence that the size of this force starts to rapidly increase at the same time as the empire is getting more engaged in the Caucasus in, in Iran. And in connection with siege warfare as well, uh, one of the changes that occurs at this time is that the Altabulakalka, as it becomes larger, starts to take on functions that Timariots used to perform. And the Chronicles mention this pretty explicitly, where they say they have examples of Altabul cavalrymen complaining and saying, this is supposed to be the job of the Timariots. And one of those jobs is guarding siege trenches during warfare. So that fits pretty much exactly. The same thing happens again during the war on Crete uh, in the 1640s and 1650s, which might be thought of as a prototypical infantry kind of war with its sieges. And, and yet the Ottoman authorities start complaining right away. We don't have cavalry. We need cavalry because we can't defend against the Venetians on the island without it. And we can't maintain our sieges. And so they start, again, inflating the size of the Alta Bulacalca. But that's kind of weird about the the, the, the protecting and, and uh, trenches, because that's one of the things they made Tamarias do to work in trenches, to dig trenches, to protect them, uh, which is sort of an argument for their less, that they had to go on campaign. They had to do mm -hmm. something. And what they were doing was digging ditches or or, or whatever, hanging around. So that's that's interesting, a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But um, we have to keep an eye, our eye out for their actually doing quality cavalry work, and which which would be better, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Captain Marius or, or Alt Baluk. Other questions? Am I not seeing hands again? I mean, am, am I overlooking any hands? I think I think we exhausted the questions. <laughs> yes, I think we did. Well, um, in that case, why don't we give Chris uh, and Linda another round of applause, a round of virtual applause. And um, yes, thank you all for uh, attending. Hey, morning, afternoon, evening, depending. And yes, thank I'll you, turn everyone. things back over. I'll turn things back over to Baki. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, it was, of course, Chris first for this great paper and uh, Linda for uh, the commentary, Jane for uh, uh, chairing the session, for the, our questioners, for attendees. I don't have the poster for our next session ready at this moment, but I can tell you uh, next month we will have Hülya Dili Hüseyinoğlu from Boğaziçi University in our WhatsApp meeting. Uh, she received the uh, honorary mention in the same competition, Graduate Student Paper Prize, with a paper entitled Governing Armenian Schools Through Ambiguity. Uh, so she will be presenting her work. Uh, I'm in touch with her right now. It will be probably the last week of April, and you'll receive an email uh, soon about it. I hope uh, some of you might join that one as well. Once again, thank you so much for joining an OTSA event, and hopefully I'll see you at another one. Have a great, great weekend. Bye. Bye-bye.